All right, why we go soul winning? Why we go soul winning? All right, what we read there in Matthew 28 is called the Great Commission. The Great Commission. This is the last thing Jesus left his disciples with before he ascended up to heaven. All right? Now, this Great Commission is mentioned in all four Gospels. John 20, verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whosoever sins ye remit. How do we get them to remit their sins? They believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Luke 24, 46, And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. (coughs) <coughs> beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. You see, God wants us to testify of these things that are done. And here he's saying, you guys have actually seen these things happen. Mark 16, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every Creature. So not only is this the last thing that Jesus is mentioning to his disciples, he's also mentioning it in every single one of the Gospels. You think this is something very important. I mean, the last words that somebody speaks, people take heed to. But unfortunately, sometimes the Great Commission becomes the great omission in the Christian life. I mean, when you think to yourself, when was the last time You told somebody else about Jesus, about how to get saved. Do you even remember when the last time was? That ought to bring some shame to your life that I am here. What is the purpose I'm here for? The purpose I'm here for is to tell people about Jesus Christ, and yet I can't even remember the last time I told somebody about Jesus Christ. We need to fulfill our purpose. This is the purpose. This this, This ought to be... The mission statement of every church. It's the main focus at our church. That's why this church exists. Matthew 28, 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Right? What are we teaching them? How to be saved. That's why then we baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. Amen. So we don't want to turn the Great Commission into the Great Omission. It's omitted in too many Christians' lives. It's omitted in too many churches. But this is the purpose of Christianity. You say, why am I here on this earth? To bring forth fruit. Well, what is that fruit that we bring forth? Well, we bring forth fruit. We're fruitful and multiply by winning souls. He that winneth souls is wise. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. This is everything. If you think about all we do in the Christian life, what is it all geared towards? It's geared towards trying to get others saved. The Great Commission. So why do we go soul winning? Why we go soul winning? Well, three reasons I'm going to give you today. First one is it's commanded. You don't have a choice. Right? It's not optional. It's not an optional ministry. Right? Soul winning, giving the gospel, it's not optional. You say, well, I don't have this gift. I don't have this talent to tell people about Jesus Christ. That's like saying, I don't, I'm not a reading person. I'm not a praying person. I'm not a going to church type of person. You don't have a choice in these matters. These things are commanded. We have to strive to grow in these areas. It's not just like, I'm not that sort of person. Well, if you're not that sort of person, then then you're in sin, right? Because you have to stop being that sort of person. You have to grow in the Lord and obey the commandments that are given us. This is what Jesus left with the disciples. So soul winning is not an optional ministry in our life. It is the responsibility of every believer. It's not only for the disciples at the time of Jesus. Because some people say, oh, that's just Jesus telling those men there, and once they did it, then it doesn't flow onto us. No, it continues to go on. Why? Because Paul wasn't there, 
that Paul was the soul winner, right? 2 Corinthians 5, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us, it's not given to me, given to us, the ministry of reconciliation. What's the ministry of reconciliation? How we tell others to be reconciled to God. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and can have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You see, God has commanded us, he is expecting us to go out to make known the mystery of the gospel, to persuade people to believe on Jesus Christ. Verse 20, Now then, we are ambassadors. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is somebody that goes to represent somebody else. That's what we are in this life. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that in the way you go about your life, the way you work, the way you deal with family and friends, the way you present yourself, the way you talk, right? The way you treat others. You are expected to be an ambassador, right? Meaning you represent Jesus Christ on this earth. What sort of ambassador are you? As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. 1 Corinthians 9, look what Paul says here. He says, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. He's saying there's nothing to boast about because I'm going out and preaching the gospel. Why? For necessity is laid upon me. But yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. See, so he's not saying, oh, look at all this, look at how great when I go out and preach the gospel and keep commandments of God. He says, no, you should be doing it. You have to be doing it. In fact, if you don't do it, woe is unto you. Right? That's the attitude. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, saying, even if I have a reward, if I don't do it, I still am commanded to do it anyway. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. <clears throat> For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without Law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. So he's saying, you know, I'll try and be as much to them that are without law, but it's still being subject to the law of Christ. That I might gain them that are without law to the weak, became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. What is this talking about? This is talking about getting, being able to relate to people that are different to you. Why? What's the purpose? I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. So you see, Paul's focus was not himself. He was trying to relate to others so that he could try and reach them. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. So you say, how is it the responsibility of every believer? We have the Jesus telling the disciples. We have Paul saying, hey, necessity is laid on me to preach the gospel. And then Paul says, you know what? 1 Corinthians 4, 16, Wherefore I beseech you, look at what he says, Be ye followers of me. You see, Paul wants us to follow his example. And if you were to put one word on Paul, what, what do you think it would be? It would be an evangelist. It would be a soul winner. right? It would be somebody that went around preaching the gospel. It's what he gave his life to. He prayed that he would have the boldness to open his mouth boldly and preach the gospel. This is what he's saying. He wants us to be like him. For this cause have I sent unto you, Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach. What's he, my ways? Right? That he's a soul winner, he's a faithful Christian, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere and in every church. 1 Thessalonians 1, And ye became followers of us, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. See, he's glad that the Thessalonians followed his example, so that ye were examples 
to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, for from you, I, I would to God that this would be said about our church one day, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. He says, Paul says, your example speaks for itself. I don't even have to tell people about you know, what you do, because what you do is already known amongst the people in the area, right? So that's what I want to be said about our church, right? That people just know that we are following the Lord. They hear the gospel from our people, clear from the Bible. You know, I love it when you, you go to the door, you, you preach the gospel to somebody and they say, you know what, nobody's ever explained it to me. That. You make it so easy to understand. That's the opportunities we're looking for. I mean, I've had that said to me so many times as we go out preach the gospel. You've got to be ready. You've got to know what you're talking about. And if you do, then you can help people understand how to be saved. Philippians 3, 17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so you as you have us for an example. So you see how it's not just for the disciples. Soul winning is not just for church leaders. Because Paul is saying, hey, hey I, the leaders are there to set the example. The leaders are not there to do the things you don't want to do, right? The leaders are there to set the example for how you should live your Christian life. Paul is doing the same. He's setting the example. He's glad the Thessalonians followed him. The Thessalonians are setting an example for those in Thessalonica as well. Philippians 4, 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard, look at this, and seen in me do. So you see how that he's teaching them, they, he's, they've received things and learned things from him, they've heard him teach things, right, preaching probably, and they see his example, and he's saying that's what you want to do. Right, so you can see here Paul is not just somebody that walked or talked the talk, Right? He also walked the walk. He wanted them to follow his example, how he was living. That's what we can... I mean, can we say that about our Christian life? Can you say that about your Christian life when you think about it? Would you want to say to somebody else, be the Christian that I am? Right? That's what you want to get to, the point in your Christian life where you can say to somebody else, be the Christian that I am. Because you know what, guys? That's what you want to be able to say to your children, your parents. Can you say to your children, be the sort of Christian that I am? Right? Because that's what your example is showing them. This is what Paul was able to do. Right? Because he dedicated his life living for God. Right? His, his God, God was his purpose. Jesus was the purpose why he lived. He was able to say this. Can we say this about our Christian life? 1 Corinthians 11. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now, ultimately, see, we follow Jesus' example. Now, I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. So we see the disciples, Paul following Jesus. Look at what Jesus said when he called his disciples. Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. What I want to emphasize for you this morning is soul winning is not just some additional ministry in the church. Soul winning is the reason why we're here. Because some people think, oh, yeah, this minute is a music ministry, and there's a kitchen ministry, and then there's the soul winning ministry. But I'm in the kitchen ministry, I'm not in the soul winning ministry. And that's not how it works. Right? This is why we're here. This is why the kitchen ministry exists. This is why all these other ministries exist. Right? That's the main purpose. It's not just one of the additional ministries. It's what you need to understand. That's why he says, here to his disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Acts 2. <clears throat> Acts 2. What I want to show you here is soul winning. Like we're talking about soul winning being a commandment. This is the purpose. It's the Great Commission. It is not only for the men. It's not only for the men, but for the women too. In Acts 2 verse 17, It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, 
I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. If you remember, this is a prophecy from Joel being fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. God didn't just pour out His Spirit on the men on the day of Pentecost to go and preach the gospel. No, he says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. See, God wants both male and female to preach the gospel. It's not just for men. And why do I say that? Because sometimes women will think, wives especially, they'll think, oh, you know, my husband does the soul winning for us. No, 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 you need to make sure you are learning how to preach the gospel too, because you know what? One day you're going to be in a situation where you need to preach the gospel and you need to know how to do it too. Right? And sometimes ladies respond better to ladies. You know, when you go out and preach the gospel, you, you can connect. But everyone needs to know how to preach the gospel. So likewise, ladies, you need to make sure you're going. Men, you need to make sure your wife has an opportunity to go. Right? Take the kids one week. Like, I, like we, me and my wife change over once a week because I want to make sure my wife is out there in the habit of talking about the gospel because sometimes she gets other chances to give the gospel and I don't want her to just be like, she's never done it before. She hasn't done it for months. She hasn't done it for years because I've just been doing all the soul winning for the family. Right? So it's for men and for women. Philippians 4.3, look at what Paul says here. And I treat thee also, true yoke fellow. So this is my, my fellow laborers. You think about the yoke that are our fellow laborers with us. Help those women which labored with me in the gospel. You say, was Paul always by himself preaching the gospel? No, he had ladies with him too, helping him. Help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. All right, so number one is soul winning. It's a commandment. That's why we're in sin if we're not participating in the Great Commission in one way or another. And people will say, like, well, can't I just talk, you know, I can just talk to people about Jesus, the people that I meet. Hey, that's great. You know, that's, that's, that's part of it, right? But what you have to understand is that's, that's not enough. You know, do you think that's all Jesus expects from us? That we just preach the gospel when it's convenient to us? No, I mean, did he, is that what he expected from the disciples? That it's like, you know, just go about your life, just keep fishing, right? And when people come to the shore and then they ask you about what you're doing, then you tell them about Jesus. Right? Don't go into all the world and preach the gospel. Just wait until people you know, that you fish with, your fellow fishermen, they're the only people you need to preach the gospel to. Don't worry about all the other people in Jerusalem and Samaria and the other part of the earth. Just wait till they come to you. Right? Obviously, Jesus expects us to do more than that. Right? To be proactive about, hey, we're going to invest some time as ambassadors for Christ, going out and making a concerted effort as a church to go and tell people that would not otherwise ask to go and bring it up to them and, and tell them about it. That's what soul winning is. You say, well, why do we do it on a Sunday afternoon door knocking? Well, the, the reason is, and I, I'm not, it's not what this sermon is about, but it's because it's just a scheduled time because the reality of the Christian life and soul winning is, is if there's not a scheduled time where we all go and encourage one another and do it together, chances are you're not going to do it. Because you might say, well, Victor, can't I just like go on my own and just go knock in my neighborhood or just go to the shops and then just go talk to people and spend an hour there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and in fact, if you did that, you'd do more soul winning than 99% of Christianity. But you know, the reality of it is most people, you know, that's just the flesh, do not have that motivation to pick themselves up and go do that regularly. And this is why church has a time where it's like, okay, well then just jump on, come a silent partner and then you know, get yourself going, right? Because most people are not going to do that. Because people make excuses, right? Well, you know, I don't have to go on Sunday and go knock door. I could just go do it myself. Yeah, if you, if you did that, great. But I'm not, then, you don't, then you don't have to come on Sunday. If you have that, then technically you might be doing more soul winning than most of us, right? But then it's there because it's a ministry to encourage people to come along and learn and take part so that they don't need that that barrier to entry. You know what I mean? So, 
If we're not involved in the Great Commission in one way or another, then we're in sin, so we need to make sure. And you know, you, you really need to take this on yourself, like, like Paul said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Because you know what? Even though you're part of a soul-winning church, you're part of a church that knows the gospel, that preaches salvation clearly, there will be situations where only you can give the gospel to that person. You know, surely there's always situations. I mean, even out soul winning, there are just people that you will click with, that nobody else would click with. And it's like you're missing out on those opportunities if you are not in the practice of preaching the gospel. So one is it's commanded. It's not just for the men, it's for the women also. God expects us to do more than just lifestyle evangelism, they call it lifestyle. Just live my life and then everyone's going to ask me why I'm so happy and healthy and beautiful and wise and then I tell them it's all Jesus, which is not even the gospel anyway, right? That's the whole prosperity gospel that gets preached by a lot of churches, which is not what the gospel is. The gospel is I'm wretched. I need a sin. I can't save myself. Jesus is what saves me. It's not about me. It's about him. Second reason. So first reason is it's commanded. Second reason is hell. Because hell exists and hell is a real place. Philippians 2, verse 9. Look at this. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You ask yourself, does that really mean every tongue, every knee should bow? What could possibly happen to me? I mean, you think the hardest atheist, the God-hater, you know, the people that don't care about God or the most staunch Muslim, whatever. There's going to come a day where everyone will bow to Jesus and confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You think, how, what, how can this happen? What's going to make them change their mind? Well, in Revelation 20, if you understand how events play out, if somebody were to die today unsaved, where would they go? They would go immediately to hell. Then there is something called the thousand-year reign of Christ, the millennial reign. So if somebody was to die prior to the millennial reign, unsaved, they are going to spend a minimum of a thousand years in a place of fire and torment that they could have got out of. Get out of jail free cut by believing on Jesus Christ, but they didn't, right? Now, what do you think that person is thinking? The first time they go down, that's probably a lot of hatred and bitterness. Like, oh, I can't believe God doing this to me. But you know, as the minutes go on, the hours go on, and the years go on, even the most hardened, atheist, God-hater, you know, Muslim, whatever, is going to realize, I wish I had believed on Jesus Christ. Right? And that goes on for a minimum of a thousand years. And then we get to the great white throne judgment. And I sat and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for him. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Look at this. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their work. Can you imagine? Somebody's there in hell. They have no idea what's going to happen. They, they're wishing they're going to get out. They wish they believed in Jesus Christ. And then for a brief moment in time, they're at the white throne judgment. The torment stops. They see Jesus Christ. What do you think they're going to say? They're going to bow down and they're going to beg, yes, you are the Lord. Save me. But it's too late. But it's too late because we need to get saved before we are judged. And these people are judged already. Revelation 20, 14, Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Hell will change people. 
Hell is a real place. Look what Jesus teaches in Luke 16 about hell. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dog came, dogs came and licked his sore. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. So you can see here there's no, there's no purgatory, there's no middle. If somebody dies and they're not saved, their next breath after they die is they open their eyes and they're in hell. Right? So some people try and explain away this passage that Jesus is teaching and say, oh, it was just a parable. It's not really talking about fire and torments. It's just like an analogy for like the burning you get when you're away from God and whatnot. But think about how parables work. Like if this is a parable, you know how parables work? Parables, you take something that is true, that is real, and then you give a spiritual meaning to it. Like, you know, and Jesus talks about the sower goes and sows the word. The parable is there actually is seed, right? There actually is a sower. Right? So you can't, have a, you can't say this is a parable when the examples that are using, it is using, they must be things that exist, right? And usually parables say like a certain man. This is like a you know, rich man and a na man named Lazarus. This is far from a parable, right? Like, I mean, Abraham really exists, right? So this is not some parable. This is an actual situation that has happened that Jesus is telling us about. Well, look at Lazarus. Well, look at the rich man's reaction if you're not familiar with this passage. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. He's talking about the earth, right? That's the gulf between heaven and hell. Then he said, look at, what he, look at his reaction. Please internalize this, guys. Look at, look, you think, what are people thinking in hell? When they go to hell and they realize they can't get out, what's their thought? Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. What does that mean? They'll change their mind. They'll believe. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. So look at what a person who went to hell is thinking. He's thinking, I wish somebody would go and tell my loved ones about how to be saved, lest they also come unto this place of torment. Right? That's what we're here for. Right? Somebody's not necessarily going to come back from the dead to tell them, but we can go and tell them what the scripture says. That's their best chance, right? Jesus says, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. That's our job, right? So we know what they're thinking. Would we not have the faith to believe what the word of God says here so that we would internalize this in our own heart and go, man, I better tell some people about Jesus Christ so they don't go to hell. Because hell is a real place. People try and not want to think about it. It's not a pleasant thing to think about. But it is a real place. You know, people will ask the question. They'll say, how can a loving God create hell? You know, people don't want to acknowledge such a terrible place, right? But you know what? This is not, this is, hell is not the love of God. That's not what hell is. That's why when people say, how, how can a loving God create hell? Because God is not only love. God is also holy. God is angry with the wicked every day. There's a side of God that is wrath on those 
that sin, but the only way we're able to have the love of God is through Jesus Christ. So without Jesus Christ, what are people left with? The wrath of God, the indignation of God, right? That's why hell exists. So it's not how can a loving God create hell, how can a holy God not create a place like hell? We realize how much God hates sin. That's what hell teaches us. And we shouldn't say, you know, well, a loving God shouldn't create hell. We should say, man, hell exists. This is what God thinks of sin. This is how I should think of sin as well. Mark 9, 47. Look at what Jesus says. He says, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. So do you believe hell is real? If you believe hell is real, I mean, aren't you concerned at all that people are going to hell? I mean, what sort of Christians are we? To know that a place like this exists, to know that we have the answer to avoid this place and not speak up. You know, we need to tell people about Jesus. I mean, do we absolutely, I mean, do you absolutely have no desire to persuade others? Surely you do. You know, that's why we have to do this. We have to overcome our fear, overcome our laziness, overcome any other excuse that you might use to not get involved in the Great Commission. And you need to come up with reasons for why. These are reasons why we go soul winning. Right? It's commanded. Hell is a real place. The last one I want to talk about is rewards, rewards. Leave this at the end. This will end on a positive note, right? Rewards. You know, I like everyone else, you know, I like a, a good investment. I only talk about investments with the boys. You know, I like a good investment. What's the better way? What's the most secure, most, uh, you know, potential gains on the top? You can invest your money, I mean, in eternal things, right? So it's something that lasts forever, not the, the dips and crashes of the stock market or the crypto market, right? So this is a good investment of our time and our resources. 1 Corinthians 3, rewards is a reason why we go soul winning because we're going to invest our life into something worthwhile. I mean, what more worthwhile than serving the Lord Jesus Christ and building up eternal rewards? Not just rewards that are going to canker like the gold and silver we all work for and the houses that one day will be gone, all burnt up. You know, that people will live their life I mean, people, people honestly, like nowadays, I mean, maybe not back in the day where you can buy a house for like 30 grand or 40 grand or whatever. So you, nowadays, people are like borrowing like 700000 800000 $900,000 and they commit 30, 40 years of their life to pay this off and that's all they do. They just work to pay that mortgage off just to get land. I mean, what sort of life, what sort of purpose is that life if that's our main goal in life and some people they treat their life that way that's, that's all they live for right as a material first corinthians 3 for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is jesus christ now if any man build upon this foundation so the work in our life in this analogy is likened to building a house of different materials on a foundation, which is Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is like that cement slab, or that rock that you build your house on. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So you see the wood, the gold, <coughs> silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, you can see that some of them are combustible, and some of them aren't. Right? So these are representing things that you do with your life that have eternal value, as opposed to things that you do with your life that do not have eternal value and will one day all be burnt up. All right, so what are you building on your foundation? What is your life about? Is your life just about material possessions, material wealth, building things in this world, 
or do you have a more eternal perspective where you are doing things for the world hereafter? That's one, run, one reason why you want to go soul winning. You want to invest some time, some of your resources into preaching the gospel, laying up treasure in heaven because you don't want to get to this judgment day, right, of believers, not the unbelievers. This is our work getting tried as believers and it all get burnt up and have nothing to show for it. But, verse 15, if any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So this is not talking about somebody's salvation. This is talking about the work they build on that foundation, which is our salvation. 1 Corinthians 9. Look at what Paul says here in verse 25. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Temperate means disciplined. right? Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Right, so he's saying people that strive to be masters in their discipline, a lot of them are doing it for something that's temporary, that's corruptible, that, that won't last forever. But he says, but when we strive to live for Jesus Christ, we are obtaining an incorruptible crown. Now what is this crown? Is this crown material possessions, material wealth? No, look what it says in 1 Thessalonians 2. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming for ye are our glory and joy. So you see what the reward is? The reward and joy and glory, it's people, right? That's our crown of rejoicing. Philippians 4.1, Therefore, my dearly beloved, and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. So these rewards, we will be rewarded because we'll have people in heaven. I mean, what can we take to heaven? If it's not people, we can't take anything you see. And that's why when I think about that verse in 2 Corinthians 4.18, when it says, look not on the things which are seen, but on things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but things that are unseen are eternal. That's something that you should reflect on every now and then when you think about where you spend your time and your resources and everything that you can see with your eyes, you know, one day that's all going to be gone. Everything that you can see, things that are seen are temporal. And the things that are unseen are eternal. Right? Those are the things we do for God, the souls we win. We can't see those, the souls of men. That's what's eternal. So are you living in a way... You know, that acknowledges that one day everything, material thing you own is all going to be gone. Or sometimes we get caught up, you know, in the material possessions. Material possessions. Second Peter 3, we're talking about why we go soul winning. Command, it's commanded. Hell exists, and we're talking about now the rewards that we earn. The reason why we should be living is living for eternity. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat in the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Remember that when we read in 1 Corinthians 3? Our works are on that foundation, the works that are therein, all those visible things that we can see that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? You know what that verse is saying there? Knowing that one day, all our material possessions will be gone and all that will be left is the eternal. What sort of person should you be? What sort of life should you live? That's what that verse is saying. Think about what sort of life you should live knowing that one day all these material things will be gone. And that's all I want you to reflect on today. Right? The reasons why we go soul winning. It's commanded. Hell. Is a real place. We need to get out there and persuade people. Still time to change people's minds and rewards. You know, don't we want to live for the eternal? So last verse. <laughs> In conclusion, 
Matthew 9, verse 35. Jesus went about all their cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. You know, isn't it great that we have a, a saviour that set the example? He's preaching the gospel. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And unfortunately, this saying is true even today. Right? The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. You know, what we need to get the job done right, to preach the gospel to as many people as we can. We need people. We need feet on the ground. You say, Victor, yeah, but I'm just going to contribute. And you go do it. But you know what? I can only talk to so many people. Right? That's why. Do resources help? Absolutely. Do we need to pay for equipment? Do we need to pay for a hall? Do we need to do all this stuff? Yeah, but there's a point where you have enough resources, right? And you need people, you know, there's a lot of organizations, a lot of volunteer organizations. That's what's missing. It's the human resources. It's the, it's the laborers, it's the volunteers that go and preach the gospel. Because you know what? You could throw a million dollars at me, $500 million at me, but you know what? I can still only talk to so many people. But you know, you give me a hundred soul winners that know the Bible and preach the gospel, and we would have knocked this neighborhood multiple times, seeing people say we would have a huge impact in this area, right? With just a small number of people, right? I mean, even if we just like, I mean, normally we have four people going out, even if we just had eight people going out, you know, double the amount of doors we knock, the number of people we talk to. We're already talking like hundreds of people a year preaching the gospel to them. We just need laborers. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. So I'd encourage you, you know, get involved. It's easy. Now, I know, I know people are scared. I know people are lazy, whatever, whatever reason. But, you know, all it takes is just, just come along. You know, even if you can't go every week, just go, you know what, I'm just going to go once a month. You know, once a month, I'm just going to start. You know, you just got to start and you'll grow, right? Even if, you know, it's a tough slog, you know, you will get more comfortable talking about spiritual things, and that's the goal. Right? You think if you can't talk to a random stranger about the gospel, you think you're going to talk to your colleague at work? You know, it's the other way around. You know, it's e much easier to talk to people that you don't see again than it is the people you see day to day. So you want to be ready to have that conversation. Right? And if you're ready, when that opportunity arises in your life, you'll take it, because right? it's there for the taking. All right, let's pray. <laughs> thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, thank you for the reminder this morning that our life is to do the Great Commission. Lord, help it not to be the great omission in our life. And I pray, Lord, that these three reasons that we talked about today would motivate us to preach the gospel and to become better soul winners and more faithful soul winners. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.